rational, calm, judicious, etc. I, I give you just a, I'm sure the same thing takes place in the Netherlands. All Americans are decent, kindly, blah de blah And you have to, I always say, let's do it empirically, shall we? Let's do it empirically to identify what the Europeans are. Because it must include Adolf Hitler, I'm afraid, and it probably has to include Joseph Stalin. It has to include all the horrors as well as all the things we think, all the vanities that we have. So defining national values becomes an exercise in vanity, an exercise in prejudice, which makes it impossible for a newcomer to embrace it. So <clears throat> it retreats into prejudice or into a covert political agenda. I'm fascinated that in Britain, where you are not, where you are allowed, if you're native born, to be Republican, the government dares to suggest that newcomers must worship the monarchy. I mean, it's quite astonishing. That's what I mean by a covert political agenda. Similarly, the American Constitution is used in the United States. You can't, you can't oppose the Constitution. Presumably, you have the right to oppose the Constitution if you're born in the United States. You want to change it or something like that. I don't know. But it cannot be, again, a substitute or it cannot fill the gap. So now, just to conclude, I'm sure you're relieved. I think the most important thing, and in the European context, it comes from a European tradition, that is in general, people should be free to live, work and settle where they choose and be protected. That is to say, government should be obliged to protect people whatever their origin, whatever their political origin. That is not at all accepted. On the contrary, there's a sharp differentiation between natives and immigrants. All should enjoy the right of freedom of thought, not being obliged to abandon their beliefs or pretend to adopt other beliefs because, they change, they, because they've changed where they live. That is to say, the pressure now on Muslims, say, to stop being Muslims, which is uh, a component in this, denies their right to freedom of thought. And that should be one of the central principles, not forcing everybody into a homogeneity. And finally, all should be treated equally. That is, nothing should be required of the foreign-born that is not required of the native-born. If your granny speaks Welsh, she should not be obliged to learn English. And if your granny speaks Bengali, she should not be obliged to learn English either. This is the state's drive for political power, overriding all the potential of a world economy. So, the key issue in joining the club should be not sharing values with other club members, which directly affects freedom of thought, but accepting the rules of the club without special discriminatory rules for newcomers. Thank you. I don't think I need to get up. Um, I think what we'll do is to have uh, Dr. Meskoub's uh, presentation, which is um, a maximum of 15 minutes. Moment. Sure, fine. Yes, fine. And, um, and I think then we'll open it up to, to, to debate and interaction. But uh, thank you, Nigel, for a very stimulating, I think, um, you can look forward to a lot of exchanges here on this. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ashwani. Thank you very much, everybody, to, who are here, and uh, Nigel for his uh, wonderful presentation. And uh, for my discussion, I found very little I can disagree with him. So uh, at the beginning, I tried to uh, pick up argument with him to make it uh, a bit exciting for all of you, but uh, I couldn't uh, in the way I wanted. So I tried to uh, quickly go over uh, his stuff, and then try to compliment them and raise some policy issues at the end and put them to debate and uh, to Nigel to see what uh, we can come up with in terms of uh, uh, combining our both presentations. The discussion that Nigel started was that initially there were no limits to uh, labor. There were restrictions to mobility of labor, but later on, once the nation state started to pick up, the social and economic integration required role of that migration to be part of the nation state, uh, nation building and economic growth. So migration and economic growth go hand in hand, especially in developing countries. And if you look at the 19th century Britain, 
and 9th century Europe, we always have had migration as an important part of the both nation building and supply of labor to rapidly, rapidly growing uh, urban areas and rapidly growing industries, some of which were not in urban areas. But this transfer has been crucial. The same in developing countries in the uh, 20th century. But there has, there has always been a panic over who these migrants are. They are dirty. They are new to the cities. Always this blame on the migrants that they are uh, dirtying our space, both in rural, uh, in developing country cities, as well as in richer countries. So the panic over Shantans, and basically what the argument is, this that we want their labor, not them. So this separation between labor and laborer has always been crucial in the uh, uh, history of migration. And people ignore that people migrate. Labor is embedded in, la in people, unfortunately. You can't separate it. This is the conundrum of economists always. You have a skilled labor, but the skilled labor is in bloody skilled person, not anybody else. Forgive my language. But the issue is people migrate, and therefore people have a cultural heritage and cult or cultural baggage. What do, what do they have? Well, it depends on your point of view. As Nigel just said, if your grandmother speak, uh, speaks uh, Bengali, then the grandmother has a cultural heritage. But it could be seen as a cultural baggage. Because when she goes uh, to see a doctor, somebody has to translate. That's, that is seen as a cultural baggage. This is the important thing in terms of integration issues that we have to really pay attention to and see the heritage side of immigration and not the baggage side. When we come uh, the, the, the forward and talk about international migration and globalization, Nigel already went over it, to the, that globalization has got different angles, goods market, uh, trade liberalization, financial market, markets, capital market liberalization, and labor markets. And here we have got transfer of production because labor costs outside uh, richer countries are cheaper, India, China, etc. You move production there. But transfer of people and workers, no. Restrictions on mobility, but no restrictions on transfer of production. When it comes to non-tradable already, the Niger said that, well, again, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the lines are not very clear. And in fact, I'm very happy to hear that uh, hair transplant is cheaper in Mumbai than in this country that saves us uh, uh, some money. But when it comes to new international migration regime that this globalization has put uh, on the agenda is a flexible, highly disposable transnational labor force. Creation of this flexible, highly disposable transnational labor force that has been the result of this new phase of in, uh, globalization. Now, let, us, let me come to some of the issues at the destination, some of the key issues uh, that uh, has arisen from this discussion. The demographic shift we all know, aging and labor supply is a problem for most of the richer uh, developed countries. And all dependency ratio, that is the ratio of the uh, people who are above 60 to people who are working, uh, is rising. Migrants are very important in this. First of all, they provide the the care which is needed for the older people. Number two, they provide the financial resources as well because they pay taxes if they are legal. And even if they are not legal, they contribute to the 